Our object today is Messier 12, otherwise known as NGC 6218. And we're here to talk about a mystery which is uncovered in this title from this paper, which is why is the mass function of NGC 6218 flat? When we talk about globular clusters, we're talking about mass of, in this case, 200,000 stars, all located in the same region of space, physically associated, gravitationally bound, and very, very old. Some of the oldest objects in the outer parts of the galaxies with stars that were formed very soon after the Big Bang. And so what do we do with an object, with an object like that? One of the first things that we do is measure the masses of all the stars in a globular cluster and put them into bins. And this forms a mass function. It says we've got this many bright ones, this many intermediate ones, and this many faint ones. And the reason we do that is that gives us a tool to understand, first of all, what the composition of the cluster is right now, but also gives us hints into how it was formed and what it's experienced since that time. And so when we do this for M52, we find something funny. Here's what the mass function of Messier 52 looks like. You see four different curves here because it's been constructed from observing four different patches of the cluster. And so we've got what it looks like in the core and in rings going outwards as well. And these are just shifted up by an arbitrary amount so that we can see them on top of each other. Now on the x-axis is magnitude. And that is, of course, the perverse way in which astronomers measure brightness and it means that a lower number here in terms of magnitude means a brighter um, star. And since these stars are all the same distance, that means a more massive star as well. So here's where the mystery comes into play. Viewers might not appreciate what the flat nature of that mass function means, but let me put it into context by showing you some different mass functions from other clusters. So again, here's a bunch of different mass functions. So we've got mass this time, and number up here, and we've staggered them vertically just so that we can see the difference. And our friend NGC 6218 is here at the bottom. And you can see how flat it is compared to the other clusters in reference here. So what does that mean? In simple terms, it means that for every high mass star, you have the same number of low mass stars. And that is a bit of mystery, considering what we think we know about how globular clusters form and how stars evolve. Because if we think that all the stars in a globular cluster were formed a very long time ago, many, many billions of years ago, and have evolved in isolation ever since, we know that a certain fraction of high mass stars would have been formed, much um, greater fraction of low mass stars would have been formed, and over time, all of those high mass stars will, will burn brightly and burn for a short period of time um, before um, they end their lives as a white dwarf or a supernova. And so that means, coming back to the present day, when we observe this very old fossil remnant of the formation of the galaxies, we should expect to see quite a few more low mass stars compared to the high mass stars, because the high mass stars should have evolved away by now. And that's not what we see here. We see a very flat mass function, which means that we're missing a lot of the low mass stars. We come to expect something called mass segregation in a globular cluster. And so this means that over time, as these stars are orbiting about their common center of mass, they're interacting gravitationally with each other because they're packed within quite a small volume of space. And every time that they have an interaction, statistically speaking, they're transferring energy and momentum to each other. So after each of these interactions, the high mass star will transfer kinetic energy to the low mass star. And as a result, the orbits of the high mass stars will tend to sink towards the center of the cluster. The low mass stars having more energy will be orbiting towards the outer parts of the globular cluster. But what mass segregation helps us predict, if you've moved all the low mass stars to the outer parts of the globular cluster, they'd become very vulnerable uh, to being removed somehow. So if there's an external force um, or just interactions with other stars in the outskirts, but if you have an even bigger external influence, like say the gravitational influence of the galaxy itself, then you can actually remove the stars 
wholesale through title stripping. And this is exactly what we think might have happened in this case because we know that the globular clusters, although many of them are observed out in the wider halo of the galaxy, they themselves orbit around the center of the galaxy and they can even pass right through the disk of the galaxy. And in doing so, we'll feel enormous tidal forces that can actually form a stream of stars that, again, will eventually populate the halo of the galaxy. The authors of the original paper I've quoted here think that up to a million stars have been lost from this cluster over the course of its life and have and now gone into populating the halo um, of our galaxy. Calculations of the orbit uh, predict that it comes very, very close to the center of the galaxy, 600 parsecs. That might be hard to fathom, um, but if you think that the nearest stars to us are only a few parsecs away, that gives you a yardstick to, to measure the very solar neighborhood around our own solar system. 600 of those is not too much, not too much bigger on the, the scale of the galaxy, which is tens of thousands of parsecs. So this is an object that's plunging through the disk of the galaxy very close to the galactic center is going to feel the tidal effects of the gravitational field there. All of these low mass stars due to mass segregation are already in the outskirts of this cluster and so will be vulnerable to being removed over many, many passages. Fast forwarding now in time, the prediction is that instead of the long lifetime predicted for a globular cluster of 20 billion years, it probably only has another four and a half billion years to go before it's destroyed completely by repeated passages through the disk. Definitely not to scale. Venus is over here. I'm loving the oversized Earth. And what's really cool about the oversized Earth is here you can see Australia has been named New Holland. That's the, like, the original name. Wow. It's a cute little moon here. 